Kia ora. Kia ora, everybody, and thank you very much for the introduction, Jeanette. Um, so my name is Peter N. Hilton, um, as the screen says, Executive Director of Agritech New Zealand. Um, and I think it's quite appropriate that um, I should be asked to kick off um, today's session. Um, Agritech New Zealand, we're a membership organisation that is part of the NZ Tech Alliance. And Tech Week 2020 is a production which is basically organised by NZ Tech. Uh, we have over 300 events this week, so it's been a very, very busy week. And certainly, speaking from a kind of Agritech perspective, um, a very interesting one as well. So Agritech New Zealand, as I said, is a membership organisation. We consist of a number of different stakeholders. Um, so industry, uh, our major corporate agribusinesses to startups, um, government agencies, research organisations, including universities, Crown Research Institutes, and collectively, we represent that wide um, agrotech ecosystem, which in New Zealand is so important. Um, I was asked to identify possibly one of the key developments in the last 12 months, and undoubtedly, um, that's reflected in the launch last week of the Agritech Industry Transformation Plan by the New Zealand government. This is a project which we've been working on now for over 12 months. And basically it's designed to accelerate um, Agritech in New Zealand, not only for the purpose of supporting New Zealand farmers and growers become more productive, profitable and sustainable, but also to enable us to help feed the world. And that's always been one of the, the key um, taglines for Tech Week. It's good for the world. And so that's something uh, that we're particularly interested in. I'll just finish off my remarks uh, really relating to Singapore, where I know some of uh, today's speakers are, are currently based. Um, last year, there was uh, an enhanced partnership agreement signed between both respective governments, both Singapore and New Zealand. And one of the key areas around that was food safety. And I think what's been really interesting in the past kind of three to four months as we've all experienced, you know, the terrible effects of uh, COVID-19 and lockdown is just how important global food supply situations uh, are. Um, I know Singapore currently uh, imports about 90% of its food and therefore food safety and food security are very important. Um, my expectation based on a decision last year to introduce a food strategy called 3030, produce 30% 30 of food internally by 2030 may well be accelerated as, uh, as COVID-19 has just demonstrated how important that uh, global food supply is. Um, but it's not just food, it's good food and good nutrition. And I know the speakers following me on today will be talking very specifically around some of the technologies that will enable that to happen. So sitting here in Taronga, in the Bay of Plenty, really looking forward to the next two hours. And uh, I hope, hope you can enjoy me uh, during this session. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Thanks. Uh, my name is Bradley Buzetto. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, thanks. Thanks to all the thanks to Amit and Jeanette and the whole team at Ecosystem for for inviting me. Um, I'm just going to switch my screen. Just give me a second. Just give me a second. All right. Just want to just want to confirm everyone can can see the presentation. Great. Sure uh, of of the the still relatively new UNDP Global Center for Tech Innovation and, and Sustainability. Um, our mandate um, is unique within the United Nations system, um, the first hub of the, of its kind to to really. Um, with the mandate of, of leveraging tech and innovation to help drive sustainability, especially across the global south um, and across the network of, of countries that, that UNDP supports around the world. Um, so that's that's who I am. I'm usually based in Singapore right now. I'm actually in, in serving out 14 days of quarantine uh, in Japan, uh, my family. Um, so I'll kick off um, by describing um, of the, the broader context, as I mentioned. So, so 
Um, this is where the point of sustainability gets really real. Um, the global population of the world will hit 9 billion in 2050. So how uh, in the world will, will we feed them all? Um, it's, it's really, um, one second. It's a, it's a set of, I think, uh, three interrelated challenges. It's a huge balancing act. Um, it's, you know, the, the one, one challenge is how do we close the gap between the food that's available today and that that's needed by 2050? It's estimated that, that about a 60% increase is needed um, in terms of calorie gap. Um, and that was even before the pandemic hit and, and uh, even in the context that, that even now um, a billion people in the world are chronically food insecure. So this is an, in and of itself a, a huge challenge. Um, the second challenge is really around agriculture, the food production is, is contributing to inclusion um, and economic and social growth, right? Um, so 75% of the world's rural poor um, essentially, well, 75% of the world's poor live in rural areas. So in other words, super high tech, um, new agricultural technologies that, that end up putting thousands, millions of people out of, out of work. So how do we balance this um, challenge as well? Um, and the third is, is third interconnected challenge is, is how do we reduce agriculture's impact on the environment? And, and you know, how do we feed all these people without further um, destroying the planet um, at an even faster rate, right? So these are the challenges. And then let me talk a little bit about some of, as far as I see them at least, um, and, and let me talk a little bit about the potential set of solutions. Um, so one set of solutions is around solving the problem of, of overconsumption. Um, at about 25% of all the world's um, food now is is wasted um so so we can there, there's there are new technologies new apps for example that help get to this problem by you know the, that we see here in the western world um, apps that that um, create dynamic pricing at supermarkets for example that that reduce the prices as, as food is about to go bad um there are new technologies that are good at um figuring out better things to do with waste, um, like compacting and composting um, food waste uh, or, or biodegradable utensils and, and, and biodegradable packaging that's, uh, that's coming on the scene. Um, and then there are alternative proteins, right? So there, there are different ways to deal with, with overconsumption. Um, and, then, well, and there's of course the fact that, that, that the world is facing a huge, especially in the developed world, uh, a huge challenge of obesity, just, too many people eating too much. Um, um, but then the second, let me see, before switching to this slide, the second set of, of, of solutions is really around um, increasing production without destroying the finite land that needs to create even more food in the future, right? So, so one set of solutions there is around improving efficiencies and sustainability around aquaculture, which um, until pretty recently has been plagued with all sorts of issues around um, all sorts of environmental issues and, and, and adding contaminants and, and, and destroying um, uh, sea life. Um, the other, another um, potential solution in this set of around increasing production is around better seeds. So how do we create more resilient and protective and productive um, seeds? Um, another is around how do we improve um, yields in Africa where there's so much the world's population growth is coming from. And then another two is around how do we not compete um, with, with biofuels and bioenergy. Um, um, but then the one that's maybe most interesting to me and to, for, for our discussion today um, is how do we simply um, farm in a, in a smarter way um, that through, through digital technologies, um, through digital agricultural technologies that are sustainable, right? Um, like for example, uh, precision agriculture. 
and we'll talk a little bit more about, about that in a bit. Um, and so once we start to solve these problems, you see that they're, the, they're co-benefits, right? If, if, if you can help farmers um, produce food more efficiently um, using less resources, using less fertilizer, using less pesticide, using less water, um, you reduce demand on the land, and you reduce uh, demand on water, um, you reduce greenhouse um, emissions, right? So it is all connected. And, in a sense, these are sort of the wicked problems of our time, right, that we need to, to solve. Um, and maybe the wicked problems of all time, in a certain sense, um, that, that are facing us and, and will face us for the next decades. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, of, too, about a couple specific stories, um, in particular Singapore story. Um, so this is a... some. This is a slide that shows data from the Economic Intelligence Unit um, on Global Food Security Index. And Singapore, maybe counterintuitively, um, has been at the top of the list for the last couple of years. Um, this is uh, the ranking um, that is composed of three key metrics on affordability, availability, and quality and safety. Um, I say counterintuitively because, of course, as, as Peter mentioned, um, that Singapore um, imports almost all of its food. So if you took into account um, the lack of homegrown food, um, then, then maybe, of course, it's not so, so food, food secure. And just, just uh, for comparison's sake, um, we'll here, is, here are the same figures for, for New Zealand. So um, New Zealand is a little bit further down the list. Um, just having some trouble moving the slides. And so just to remind us what's really needed for food security, um, self-sufficiency as much as possible to, to boost your own food supply and have diversity in that. Um, but in the sense that most countries, of course, cannot produce everything they consume, so you need to focus on what you're good at, um, what are your comparative competitive advantages. Um, in Singapore's case, um, it's hugely important that um, flexible and reliable trade partners and, and it's interesting when when the pandemic hit um singapore um very quickly um set up um bilateral agreements with several countries to ensure um the supply of essential goods and including food and including i think with with new zealand uh, with other countries as well um and so that's really at the, the at the the crux of, of why Singapore scores so well in terms of food security is that it's built an extremely elaborate um, and solid and diverse um, set of trade partners. So they don't, they don't, Singapore doesn't rely on any one or two partners for um, really important staple um, supplies of food. And of course, strategic revert, reserves and investment in, in food, in regional food security too is, is hugely important. Um, a lot of people still aren't aware of what the pandemic, for example, has done to, to um, food supplies um, in, in Africa. Um, huge disruptions across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, a bit more about um, the Singapore uh, context. Um, so, as the previous speaker mentioned, about 10% of the food supply is produced locally. Um, but the 30 by 30 goal is to produce 30% of its nutrition needs uh, by 2030. And so Singapore has really um, uh, embarked on a kind of all of government, society, economy um, uh, initiative um, to, to create um, a, a globally important um, future of food hub in a sense, um, investing uh, tons of money, hundreds of millions, uh, if not more, um, into research and development on the future of food, um, encouraging private capital, and encouraging especially venture capital. Um, so that there are now several venture funds specialized in the future of food based in, in, in Singapore, um, incentivizing also entrepreneurs um, as well, um, setting up labs and so forth. Um, and so Here's just more data on, on, on what Singapore is up to. Um, the, the idea is, of course, to diversify um, imports, but also um, 
grow its 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 local um, capacity. Um, one interesting point here about the Singapore story is that over the last 20, 30 years, I mean, they've essentially, maybe almost uniquely, um, uh, been a country that has lost, sort of skipped a generation of, of farmers, right? Um, there just hasn't been enough agricultural land to, to have that make any sense. And so the new generation of farmers that are coming on are are often super entrepreneurial, um, often with tech backgrounds, uh, finance backgrounds, um, that are 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 are, are uh, that are racing in a sense to 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 exploit uh, new opportunities in Singapore and of course um, globally um, with agritech and with future food and alternative proteins as well. Uh, a lot of really interesting work around um, in, in in the space of uh, urban agriculture too. Um, talk a little bit about digital farming, but I also wanted to mention um, what um, what we have been doing at the UN Development Program too, um, with our mandate of, of trying to bring tech and innovation solutions to, to the rest of the world. Um, so on the back of, of um, Singapore's big push into the future of food in this 30 by 30, um, we've launched a, a global innovation initiative called Cultivate. Um, with the um, express aim of, of surfing, surfacing um, uh, new and we think transformative digital technologies from the developing world um, and helping them um, connect and then scale um, across other countries within the global south. Um, and, and we've worked with um, the Singapore government agencies that are helping support this 30 by 30, but also with um, private capital, special venture, venture, especially venture capital funds based out of out of Singapore, specializing in agri-tech to, to do this with us. And, and um, so far, I think it's been pretty successful. We've identified um, 30 finalists in a sense, um, 30 really uh, star uh, startups and R&D outfits that, that we are helping now scale across, um, across the world. Um, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit here about um, the promise in the sense of digital farming. So digital farming is, is, is the whole point of that is, is really to, you know, it's data driven farm management. Um, the whole point is to, is to, uh, to achieve higher yields with, with less, right? Um, and using data from satellites, drones, um, sensors, cameras, um, and just to give a couple of examples of, of some of the, 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 the ventures that, that we're working with, um, you know, got biops um, out of uh, biops agrotechno out of Indonesia, that's um, using the internet of things technology for, for irrigation, um, improved efficiency in irrigation. You've got crop in out of India um, that is also using AI and, and, and big data too in, in great ways to, to uh, improve yields. Um, we've got Zespri, um, not working with them yet, but Zespri out of New Zealand, which is another great example of um, using, um, using new data methodologies um, for, to, to power um, digital farming. Um, I know um, blockchain has gotten a, a bad rap, but I want to talk about more broadly about um, technologies um, it, uh, that, that help with traceability as well. Um, you know, food supply chains um, are often not really transparent or, or the most efficient. Um, so, so there are just more broadly technologies around decentralization that can really help. Um, we, uh, within the UN Development Program, are um, doing research on this and developing um, essentially the use cases um, uh, on traceability um, from absolutely the point of production all the way down to, to um, the, the customer, um, two or three products in two or three very far flung uh, locations around the world um, to see if we can then um, help scale some of these technologies up again, uh, again, focusing in the, in the global south. Um, I mean, other, um, other areas to highlight too, and other innovations within um, agriculture, of course, around um, alternative proteins, another um, interesting uh, player in the space 
that maybe not too many people have heard of um, is, is uh, Shok Meats, which, which they're also based in Singapore, which is they're creating cell-based um, shrimp. Um, um, so it could have very interesting implications for aquaculture, but then of course for um, uh, food supply in, in, in Asia and across, across the globe, um, if that scales. Um, but also around urban farming, and that's not just about vertical agriculture, which is often very expensive, um, still very expensive, but, but also um, figuring out how to, how to plant underground or in roofs or in car parks. Um, again, another interesting um, use case out of Singapore, um, an outfit called City Ponics, um, that has come up with their own uh, proprietary zero waste farming um, technology and, and also is connected with with um, ensuring that um, it's very much driven by by social good and and, and, and and working with marginalized parts of the population too but but their technology is something that could really scale and their approach is something that could really scale um, in different parts of the world um, so these are some of the um, some of the uh, just sort of a taste of some of the opportunities and some of the ways um, in which we can use technology to get back to to some to really get, get a grip on some of these challenges that that I that I outlined in the very beginning. Um, I you know I I work with the United Nations, so I have to be optimistic, and I and I do think that if if we if we work with intent um, and collaboratively and between the private sector and Big global organizations like ours in the UN, we can make a difference. And and um, you know, I think some of these new digital um, agriculture technologies can make a make a huge difference in in sustainability um, uh, of our food supply um, for the world um, going forward. And and so so with that, um, I'll hand it back to to Jeanette. Great, thank you for that. Um, now, our next maker, speaker for the session, um, Paul. If you want to stop sharing your screen, Bradley, and then Paul can. Yeah, yep. got it. Great, <laughs> thank you. Right, Paul Ryan from Trust Codes. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's good to come on the back of uh, the UN presentation because we think um, sustainability development goals are extremely important um, to the issue of improved agri-tech. So um, good to be here today on Tech Week New Zealand. Um, I'll get straight into it. Uh, in a, uh, this concept of volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, it's called VUCA, has come out of the military and entered the uh, mainstream in business terms and particularly today in a COVID world uh, consumers are looking for a lot more truth about their food and that truth needs to be a data-driven truth for example is it safe where did it come from what's your product doing for the planet uh, what is um, sorry can I trust you as a processor and these questions have become even more important uh, during this COVID crisis um, at the same time, we're seeing a rise in consumer trust issues. And uh, just late last year, um, Edelman released a trust barometer report in Brands We Trust. This is pre-COVID, at least in the Western world, pre-COVID. And at that stage, 81% of consumers were saying, I must be able to trust the brand to do what's right. And I think importantly, 70% were linking purchase to considerations, including supply chain, reputation, uh, values, environmental impact, and customer for profit. And I, I suspect strongly that 70% has increased uh, during the current COVID crisis, particularly around supply chain um, and safety. So I think the question we like to start with as a software business is um, we're unashamedly consumer first. We focus on what consumers are actually wanting from their food uh, at fiber industry and suppliers. And I think the top thing everyone's looking for is trust and safety, and that doesn't matter the demographic. 
So uh, consumers buying cheap meat in the US are equally as alive to uh, safety issues as, for example, uh, someone buying an expensive cut of prime or better beef. So trust and safety is can I trust you and is the food safe? We're seeing a, a big rise in functional options. So consumers saying, well, hang on, if I'm, I don't want empty calories, I don't, don't, don't just want to eat calories, I want to uh, focus on um, foods that contribute to my health and well-being. So nutrient deficit, for example, or, um, or uh, for example, if I'm deficient in zinc or my population is deficient in zinc, what are my functional options and, and how do those products uh, or the food products I'm engaging with uh, contribute to my wellness? And we've seen a lot more of that in, a, in this COVID world where consumers are realizing uh, food as medicine is actually a, a real thing. We're still seeing a lot of focus from consumers on sustainability. And I think the conversation, for example, a, a good uh, example is the conversation about plastic pre-COVID has changed slightly. That these conversations are now being balanced with plastic providing safe food and safe packaging, but uh, with concern for the future and sustainability of our planet. And the UN Sustainability Goals uh, do go to a lot of our food um, brand and manufacturer and grower um, ideals in terms of feeding the planet, making sure the right food's in the right place, uh, reducing food loss in the production cycle, and reducing food waste at a consumer end. So how to make sure the consumer makes the best of their food, and improving uh, efficiency and uh, management of the actual manufacturing or processing uh, or growing function to reduce food loss prior to getting to the hands of the consumer. We're also seeing a lot of conversations from consumers about values and purpose. They're looking for brands that have, a, uh, have values and a real purpose, not just um, greenwashing around sustainability or even if a brand is completely committed to uh, the sustainable development goals as we are, but also uh, why do you grow or make your food? How do you do it? Um, and in COVID times, we saw a lot of noise out of the US meat industry. A lot of uh, COVID clusters actually came out of uh, meat processing plants uh, in the United States. And we started to see a lot of questions about why that was, and questions come out about labor practices and production practices, and could they be improved? And so consumers started to become very alive to those questions, questions they would have never thought about um, in previous years, suddenly became really live. And brands that did best in this environment were the brands that could digitally engage with their consumers and keep the conversation alive, learn what they cared about, and also start telling their story. Uh, experiences, we saw this big shift in COVID to people cooking at home and starting to say, well, well this is good. I bought, I bought a cut of meat or I bought some products. What do I do with it? And is it good for me? What, what should I be putting this with or pairing it with? And uh, tell me about my experience as well as the, um, the functional options we spoke about before. And should I pair it with wine or should it be white wine or red wine? And what should I do? And what ingredients can I use to make this a bit more exciting? And the longer lockdowns go, I think the more consumers we're looking for that digital experience. And I think a lot of this is driven by data-driven storytelling, fact-based uh, information. I've never met a consumer who said, give me lots of data. Consumers are in interested in relevant contextual information to their circumstance, their location, the weather outside, uh, for example, population nutrient deficiencies, um, all of those questions come to bear. And I'll get into the tech side of this shortly, but um, this is a big question from consumers and it's global and it's across all generations is what we're finding. So it's no longer just a, um, a millennial question, we're seeing it across all generations through to boomers. So at the same time, um, I, I haven't mentioned cloud here because I think cloud is not an engine of our future. I think it's uh, well established and we'll hear from um, Microsoft shortly on some of these, so I won't steal their thunder. What we are seeing is machine learning uh, today. We're not seeing a lot of true AI, but we're seeing a lot of machine learning as, as data begins to flow out of um, agricultural production systems. And that's improving efficiency, but it's also improving pattern matching and figuring out how to get food to consumers the most efficient way and in a safe way and in a way that reduces spoilage, food loss and food waste. Um, we're seeing the Internet of Things. We're, we're going to hear a lot about sensors and the amount of data flowing off farm, for example, that can assist um, 
for example, um, measuring taste at the consumer end can um, uh, contribute to decisions around pruning of citrus crops, for example. Sweeter crops come from this particular orchard or the stand in the orchard. Uh, we prune it and, and look after it that way. Regenerative practices, et cetera, et cetera, will contribute to the um, experience. And that's been going to be driven by um, sensor data. Uh, mixed reality is, is going to that whole um, view that consumers don't want data, they want an experience and they want information that's relevant to them and that's best delivered in a, in a meaningful sort of mixed reality way or augmented reality way off the, um, off the phone. Blockchain, the B word. Uh, look, I, I, I think blockchains are an emerging technology. I think there's been a lot of hype around it, but I also believe the current consensus mechanisms on traditional blockchains like Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin chains are um, too unwieldy, too expensive, require too much energy consumption, and there are faster, cheaper alternatives to secure messaging. That doesn't mean blockchain won't be there. We built one, so we, we got excited about it too. But we're realistic that it's a future secure messaging technology that can help uh, democratize information while keeping um, private information exactly that in terms of the manufacturer or supply chain. Uh, 5G, we're pretty sure it didn't cause COVID, but we do believe it's going to be a big uh, deliverer of, of new consumer experiences and consumer expectations of information that's relevant and digestible. And that's just sheer speed. And quantum computing, of course, will drive the um, move from machine learning to true, or uh, sorry, true artificial intelligence, where the machine is learning its own patterns. And, and we think... Uh, that will bring a material shift in the way we look at production data through to consumer. And it will allow the consumer to make more informed choices. Uh, we're already seeing this concept exist. So this is nothing new. This is this digital economy in the food uh, and fibre sector. You've got um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions, billions of consumers connected uh, via smartphones. And those connected consumers are, are expecting there to be connected digital supply chains and they're expecting connected um, labeling and packaging in the way that they can engage with it. So not just a barcode you scan at checkout, but a barcode or some kind of mechanism they can engage with to learn more about the product and engage with the product in a more meaningful way and get those experiences that are um, relevant to them. So I think uh, I likened it the other day. If anyone remembers airline travel, I know most of us have forgotten it. Um, occasionally, the airline might lose your bag. And that was just a disbelief that an airline could actually lose a bag. And consumers feel the same way. They're saying, well, everything's connected. Why can't you be transparent and tell me the truth about how sustainable this product is? Is it good for me? You know, how do you make it? What are your labor practices? And, and um, Consumers are expecting the tech stack to deliver that. And funny enough, that tech stack is available. Uh, it, and there are brands doing a very good job of this, um, using platforms uh, like ours to engage with their consumers. And they're putting consumer first. And those are becoming the digital brands that are disrupting themselves and the rest of the um, consumer packaged goods and food and fiber space. Uh, the risks to food assurance can generally be summarized as one of two big risks, and that's bad character, someone doing the wrong thing, and bad data. And uh, bad data often allows bad characters to uh, maximize their economic return. Most bad characters are doing it purely for economic benefit. So the trick in, uh, in food um, and fiber supply chains and agri-tech supply chains is to manage the risk of bad data because then you can start weeding up bad characters. So managing a, a transparency approach, and that doesn't require um, complex systems like blockchain, it requires participants within a private supply chain through to the consumer to agree how they will share and handle data. And it requires good mathematics and capability in the cloud, and it requires consumers to engage via a platform with the brand. And once you do those things, you can start eliminating the bad characters, and more importantly, eliminating the bad data. So um, smart brands are harnessing data to be responsive to VUCA, to volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So I think the big thing we have seen is the expectations of consumers are changing incredibly rapidly. So there's been the sudden shift to uh, focus on wellness and health. Um, I've said post-COVID, but 
I was probably a bit optimistic. I am in New Zealand, so it feels like post-COVID down here. But in the COVID world, consumers are returning to this focus of healthy eating and returning to a focus on kind of knowing who they're buying from. So uh, getting an idea of the, the people that uh, grew or made the food, they want that connection back again, the way it used to be um, in my parents' generation. But they don't want to go and meet the greengrocer, they, they want to be able to engage digitally. I think um, crisis and unpredictability um, are being harnessed by smart brands. So for example, we've got customers that use uh, transparency tech to move product around in export markets to make sure they were responsive to consumer demand and didn't leave empty shelves. They were able to turn on a dime and start shifting product around so they never failed to have product in the market when it counted. And they knew where their uh, demand and supply gaps were. So COVID's impact on supply chains, for a while you couldn't get a ship for love nor money, and that might still be the case. So. Smart brands are saying, well, how do I leverage my data? Where's my closest product? Where's my demand? And they're moving very, very quickly to uh, ameliorate their supply chain risk and at least engage with their consumers to say, this is what we're doing about it. And then, of course, you've got the traditional regulatory expectations like food recall. And, you know, there's a good example of a recall of cheese in New Zealand. Um, but uh, having had some of that cheese in my fridge, I, that particular brand didn't engage with me at all. So all I had to do was take it back to the supermarket and I was pretty sure it was recalled. It turns out it was. I'd eaten some. I had no clue from the brand how much risk I was at. There'd be no communication with me as a consumer. So smart brands are again saying, well, if I'm going to have a, uh, a recall, a regulatory recall, I better do a really good job of talking to my consumers. So they're marking each individual product with its own digital identity. And, and, and it's not only trust codes. I don't want to pitch trust codes as... There's a number of parties doing this, um, marking their products with a unique digital identity and then uh, working with the consumer, partnering with the consumer, if you like, to share information about that exact item they're holding in their hand. So we say we've got a lot of data out there. It's flowing from the farm. It's flowing from supply chain. It is in silos. I think we all have to accept there are going to be silos for a lot longer. We're not expecting to see a true democratization of data. And again, I've never actually seen a consumer say, give me data. So we're harvesting all this data into the cloud and we're applying machine learning because that's available now. And I won't steal uh, the following speaker's thunder, so I'll leave it at that. We're saying AI comes later because um, true AI does require um, more uh, processing power than is generally available, even with a glut of GPUs on the market. Our customers and our smartest customers are capturing all the data they can. Even uh, they accept silos exist, but they're using as much, they're taking as much data as they can get. Sometimes they don't even know what they're going to use the data for, but they're pretty sure that they'll have enough data soon to start discerning patterns they couldn't otherwise see. We had quite a big nutraceuticals brand recently point out that the data they'd obtained uh, showed them their product was moving into market in half the time that um, we uh, had thought the product was moving into market. And that allowed them to change and look at their supply chain. I think leveraging platforms um, and cloud-based platforms and the current tech allows people to relentlessly drive data intelligence. And I think you have got to focus on security of data. I know a lot of consumers give away their privacy in return for some services on social media, but I think we can reliably predict that's going to change and uh, that brands that don't protect data or take all steps to protect data, um, their own plus their consumer's data, will eventually suffer the consequence of losing that data to somebody and losing trust. So um, I haven't talked a lot about tech other than to say, uh, look, I think there's no need to overcomplicate this. We're seeing a lot of noise, people trying to create their own data standards. Um, and creating um, uh, alliances of companies that want to create some kind of standard. And I think the reality is uh, GS1, the global standard of the barcode you see in the supermarket, do a whole lot of transparency and traceability data standards. And that's the ideal interoperability that's required here. And that allows silos to exist. It reflects the reality we're saying don't create new standards, leverage data um, standards like GS1. And we do see a lot of tech um, being a solution looking for a problem. Tons of criticism of QR codes. 
for example. But the reality is that's exactly what consumers know what to use, particularly in a post-COVID world. In markets like China, it's uh, de rigueur for everything. In uh, markets like the US, UK, we're seeing rapid increase in, in um, QR engagement. So a unique QR on every product allows that conversation to occur. And you can use a ton of tech to make sure the QR code is not copied or they aren't putting fake websites up. Because consumers don't want data. They want information and reassurance and assurance. And that needs to be data driven. But they don't want you to give them so much data they can't make head nor tail of it. What they really want you to do is say, don't worry, we've got this in hand. So assurance is more than just data. Um, I think brand protection is truthful storytelling, the product, who you are. I think contextual um, information and storytelling to consumers based on where the product is, is now to be expected by consumers. I think managing recall to protect your brand is a big part of the data and you need to over communicate when doing that. And I think importantly, showing consumers that your brand is worth connecting and that you care about, uh, protecting, sorry, and that you care about their well-being is a key use of data on platforms. And the cloud's there, the consumers are connected, what you need is a platform to bridge it. And we hear a lot about transparency and traceability. I couldn't agree more that it's foundational. Knowing where your product is, and that's actually a map of one of our customers' actual products in market. And they learned a lot of um, information about, uh, for example, product distribution up the Silk Road, and also some product arriving in places like North Korea, which was a real surprise to them. So knowing where your product is, where it should be, helps combat those bad actors that want to interfere with your supply chain and most importantly, improve supply chain resilience. Couldn't be more important in the COVID world. Uh, management of food loss and reducing food waste is a traceability function as much as anything. Tracking inputs, outputs, and what the consumer gets and what the consumer uses is critical. Traceability and recall used to be all about one up, one down. I track the person before me, I track the person after me. Look, I've got traceability. It's, it's not traceability. And it certainly doesn't allow you to provide transparency and encourages data silos. And I think um, traceability helps you respond to a change in demand, transport availability and geopolitics in a crisis like the one we're in now. And the brands that are winning, and certainly we can see it in the volumes of product being shipped by our customers, are the ones who took digitization really seriously, invested in um, how they tracked and managed their product and engaged with consumers. They've come out you know, with a significant increase in demand from consumers in big global markets including the US actually, we've got lots of honey customers doing really well in the US and in the Middle East. So I'm going to finish with just a, um, I think data and a consumer focus will actually help drive novel applications. I'm not going to show the video because I don't have time, but actually uh, this is a smart bin. It uses a camera over the bin and what they're doing is in a restaurant, they're tracking um, food waste so they can recommend portion sizes in the restaurant and reducing that food waste in the restaurant. What we're seeing is all these insanely clever applications coming out of cheaper sensors, more available data, and feeding the data back up right through the supply chain to help shift food to where it's actually needed and not over um, having an over calorie or calorie surplus in some places and a calorie deficit in other places. There's more than enough food. It's just where we've got it is the problem. So transparency, traceability, data, that's clearly our future. Um, there needs to be platforms that deliver that to bring all the data together and stitch it together in the cloud and make it available in a secure, safe way. So thank you very much. I, um, I only had 20 minutes to talk about one of the most complex topics that I've spent 20 years learning about. So I do apologize if it wasn't detailed enough for you, but happy to take questions. Great, thanks, Paul. Wow, that was a, quite an effort. <laughs> 20 minutes um, and any questions um, audience members any questions that you have please just put them through to the chat and at the end of the after the panel sessions we'll open it up for Q&A so if our panelists can please join us now um, we've got um, Amit, Amit, Andrew, Claudia and Paul joining us for our panel session today um, and everybody's off mute yep almost yes. um, all right so I will fire away um, we, I will fire away with um, obviously a quick sort of a summary of what we've covered there that we've covered quite this an expanse of 
of everything that needs to be considered in this um, topic around leveraging technology for food assurance. And now we want to do a bit of a deep dive into some of the key points that's the, that the speakers mentioned, but also in terms of the, the overall, um, overall uh, perspective that, that Peter set at the start. So I will just fire away. Obviously, there's enormous interest in and demand from the agricultural industry worldwide in the opportunity that technology presents for increasing productivity, profitability, and sustainability. Um, the first question, what role does collaboration and the development of partnerships across the ecosystem and globally, including with farmers, with the private sector, researchers, and the government play? Um, Claudia, if you could start us off. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thanks for having me. And, and my short answer would be, it's absolutely important, right? Uh, you heard Bradley talk about the challenges we're facing. We're trying to produce more with less land, with less resources, with less labor, and by the way, in more uncertain conditions. So how is this going to work? It's not something that one uh, government, one organization can solve alone. Uh, from a technology perspective, we see technology playing an absolutely important role in helping uh, making better decisions. And this doesn't matter if this is about uh, more precision farming, recognizing a pest, food safety. We talked a lot about those different things. It's really about enabling better decisions. And this is done by data aggregation. It's about bringing data together in a way that can uh, be analyzed and accessed. And that's really one of the things we're doing with FarmBeats and uh, where we provide an open ag data platform where others can build solutions on top of it. But I, I want to mention quickly on, uh, we have initiatives on the societal side where we want to bring technology to rural farming. And here we uh, work both with um, commercial partners, but also with the government. And just to give you one example, uh, there is a technology called TV white space to transmit data on farm and don't want to got Technic, technical, but we need to help, uh, have the government's help to change regulations so we can take advantage of those things. Uh, we work on uh, sort of educating farmers to work with technology. And then on the innovation side, we really work closely with universities and research organizations because there's not enough data scientists in the world to develop AI models and uh, advanced analytics as quickly as we needed to really make those changes in, in digital farming. Great. Thank you. And other panelists, your thoughts on the same subject? Well, and, and look, I'd maybe just like to leverage on, on what Claudia said. Um, uh, we certainly don't have enough um, data scientists to work in that space. I don't think we have enough richness of data yet uh, either. Uh, and I would say some of it does come back to, and this might sound like it's contrary to what Paul just said about, we don't need more standards. We need standards in different spaces, right? We don't need standards in the supply chain traceability. GS1 covers that beautifully. Um, but we do need standards, not even necessarily IT standards. We need standards of how we measure things so that we know we're talking about the same things. Um, you know, if you're talking about animal welfare or um, some of the sustainability metrics, uh, we can also the same top level words, but what it actually means underneath in terms of practices and behaviours and what's happening to crops or animals or, or nutrients can be completely different. We don't yet have enough data to be able to reliably compare between systems and say, actually, you're doing that really well, or the long term consequences of what you're doing are not that great. So, so. Um, we don't just need more data scientists, we also need more data for them to work with. Right. Anyone else have any more thoughts on partnerships and collaboration, both, both locally and globally? Yeah, no, I, um, I, I, I just want to add to what uh, Claudia and, and Andrew just uh, referenced. You know, if you look at some of the most um, powerful outcomes that we can achieve, um, whether it's use of data. And, you know, Paul, actually, I, I really like that statement, Paul. It's not about the data, right? Data means nothing. It's really about information that helps you make decisions, right? And um, I think unless there's a whole, unless you're part of an ecosystem, uh, no pun intended, not for us, uh, but unless you're part of an ecosystem, you can't actually do much with that because you're going to be sitting in isolation and it doesn't mean much, right? So it's very different from the old days when you had, information sitting on your PC and you were doing things so that this is actually being, um, you know, bringing more efficiency 
better customer outcomes um, and, and you know overall achieving bigger, higher impact goals across the value chain. And that's not going to happen if you don't have the right partnerships and, uh, and the ecosystem. And that in today's world, especially with emerging tech, I think is not just the, you know, the technology companies or customers and so on. You've got to be looking at, um, you know, other sort of agencies or organizations or even universities, for example, that are actually trialing, um, you know, new sort of solutions. So it's going to be part of those uh, ecosystems. Yeah. So Peter, that was a big part, I think, of the Agritech ITP launch the other day. A big part of that conversation, wasn't it, was about partnerships and collaboration? Yeah, absolutely, Janet. If I could just add to one or two of the comments that have been made, and a really good example based on what Andrew said around data standards. Um, this is a classic example of where within the Agritech um, industry transformation plan, there is a very specific work stream being set up to look at um, ag data standards and regulation. Uh, and what's going to happen there is that clearly, normally, this would be kind of run by government. Um, but we're going to have a, an industry um, support group that will work with government to ensure that uh, industry has its input. And what we found through the whole process of the Agritech ITP is that by getting collaboration from not just industry and government, but also bringing in research organizations and other parties, we've had significant buy-in to the opportunity. And so going forward, the fact that you've got that entire ecosystem working together, there's much more chance of the main goals and aims of the plan you know, succeeding. So, so, so certainly I think our experience, and I, I do get uh, calls including from Singapore, from other countries asking whether they can replicate the type of ecosystem we've built here, because they can see the value of government, industry and research working together. So hugely valuable. Bradley? Thanks, Janet. I mean, and just building on what Peter said, I mean, I think ecosystem builders in a sense like uh, what Peter is creating with, with Agritech New Zealand and, and what Singapore has done are hugely essential, right? And, and I was kind of surprised um, at, um, at, at, at how, how interested so many of these startups and beyond startups and pretty mature um, companies, um, ventures in the agritech space were appreciative of what we were doing within the UN, um, trying to help them scale and bring them to different markets around the world. Because I had assumed that many of these would already have the means, um, you know, to 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 access these markets. But and and um, so we're in a sense playing the sort of aggregator of ecosystems role um, within the United Nations in this instance. Um, again, I you know some of these are big and very well known companies, but they were they were, you know we offered no financial incentive to them to 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 be part of this initiative, but uh, they just very much appreciate the broad network of of offices and countries and markets and things. Um, so just to say to the point, I mean, yes, the collaboration between all sorts of different entities is absolutely essential to, to, to make any impact here, I guess. Right. Paul probably has something to add to that. I, I was just going to echo what Andrew said, actually, because I agree. I think GS1 is a as a data standard for supply chain and a common business vocabulary is nailed it. So I don't want to spend much time on that, but I agree we're not seeing enough data yet. So I, th I think I made the comment, take as much data as you can get. You don't know what you're going to do with it yet. Machine yeah. learning is getting cheap. Um, AI is coming off quantum computing. So we'll get a much better sense of what these data models mean and I agree there's just not enough data scientists. So let's get the data there into systems. Cloud storage is cheap and start, you know, building ML models around the big issues. So food loss, food waste, for example, is a big one that uh, email machine learning right now can really benefit. And they're starting to see a lot of data because you're starting to be able to map what's going on in markets versus what's happening on the supply chain and start mapping the gaps. So, I think, yeah, the, ch the challenge is people claiming or credence claims and definitions of animal welfare or organic or sustainable or regenerative farming. It depends where you live in the world is what that means. So I think that's the um, standards we're still yet to see and that'll be driven again by all the data <laughs> that we still are in the early stages of collecting. And I was I was just going to add to that, thinking along the collaboration line and perhaps picking up a bit on what Peter and Bradley have said, is we need to collaborate internationally as well. So it's great that New Zealand uh, Agritech ITP has got a data stream. 
Uh, and the exciting thing about that is we're not just looking at how that plugs into the New Zealand ecosystem, but we need to collaborate internationally on that because otherwise it's wasted. Uh, and the, the second thing is we need to make sure that we're collaborating not just with technologists and data scientists and software people, but we're actually talking to uh, so social researchers and we're talking to traditional biologists and chemists because they know a whole lot more of this stuff then our models will, will flick out. So that, so that conversation around um, you know, the collaboration and, and the partnerships is obviously around the, the why behind that is, um, is the consumer, you know? And so we talked about the consumers having, looking for different things in terms of the products that they buy. And, and, and we've, we've had, um, you know, mentioned the climate change, biodiversity loss, degradation of waterways and other things and the importance of, um, of sustainability. Um, and so, so why don't we talk specifically around some of the challenges in that space? So, so the importance of data and technology and leveraging it, but specifically the challenges and opportunities around, around ensuring uh, quality, food safety, um, and being, being still able to be responsive as well to consumer demand. If someone wants to kick off, um, Paul? You get on mute technology, uh, NZ Tech Week. Um, I think uh, uh, consumers uh, they have that minimum hygiene standard of um, of safety and trust, and uh, brands really need to leverage both data and character. And if you, look, the reason I summarise the problems in food assurance as being bad character or bad data is that either someone's trying to do the wrong thing, or they don't have enough. Uh, points of reference to do the right thing. They're not capturing uh, quality results or test results. They're not um, QA locking before they get um, biological tests back or pathological tests back. Um, or there's uh, insufficient data around um, spray residues in some crops in some countries. So it's it, to me, it's either a data or a, um, a character problem. And I, you can't fix character. Um, if someone's going to try and do the wrong thing, you won't stop them trying to do the wrong thing. You've just got to use systems and processes to catch them and then make sure they bear the ultimate consequence of trying to hurt their fellow humans. So, um, you know, a good jail sentence will do a counterfeit a, a load of good. Um, but uh, to catch them, you need really good data and to catch recalls before they happen and to manage food loss and food waste is all that, um, I think, data in, data out assessment. And then you can get onto the more um, interesting uh, data around how do I define animal welfare? What is my um, robust objective standard around animal welfare? And if I'm gonna make a claim that I'm really good to my animals before I kill them, then I need to um, be able to evidence that with some meaningful objective data set. And so, um, the consumer, if they stop trusting a brand or a country or a production process, they will simply stop buying products. And, and the Johnson Johnson um, asbestos laden um, uh, talcum powder is a good example of just a massive waste of, of enterprise value off a simple fact they weren't testing enough data. And if they had been testing enough and had the data, they could have avoided a, a, a consumer health scare. So I think. Um, Ultimately, agri-tech needs to focus on the consumer, no consumer, uh, no customer, no customer, no sales, no sales, no business. So um, if you can't give the consumers assurance and the information they desire, and the only way we're gonna do that is to start building sensible data sets. And, and I'm not sure we'll ever get competitors collaborating with each other, for example, or even um, separate industrial systems collaborating with each other. What we can do is make sure the data is available to the consumer in some way and let the consumers make their choices based on sensible, objective, available information. Can I, so that, can I, sorry, can I, just, can I just add to what Paul was saying? I think um, it's also really critical to have, you can't have these pieces again in isolation, right? Because it's not gonna serve much of a purpose. Um, it's gotta be institutionalized. There has to be some accountability at the top of the pyramid. So as an example, um, you know, and, and we'll probably touch on this later on today in the session at the, uh, the FinTech session because that's on sustainability. But SGX, for example, the Singapore Exchange, 
has actually made it mandatory for companies to report on the sustainability practices, right? So it's, you have to institutionalize that. You know, Paul shared the example of Johnson Johnson. I mean, if organizations, it has to start at the top because the little guys can keep doing what they, they're doing, but it doesn't really make that much of an impact. It's got to start at the top and the others will follow. So I think there has to be some level of uh, consistency in how all of this is being reported. There are, you know, sustainability is not just climate and environment. Obviously, it's, uh, you know, fair wages, ethical practices, and so on. Um, and consumers are getting more aware and more conscious, and they want to be making the right choices. So if we make brands accountable then and, and leverage all the technology and the data then, then it makes it much more meaningful. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just jump in to, to follow on Amit's uh, comments too, if I may. Um, so th there's all this data, speaking of data, around um, the, the, the remarkable preferences um, of the, the current generation or the upcoming generation, Gen, Gen Z, right? Which I think McKinsey did it, um, a, an important study of, of um, their preferences on sustainability. And, and it's arguably the first generation that is making huge life changes um, in terms of where they're going to work, um, what job they're going to perform, um, what they're going to consume, um, really uh, 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 with sustainability as a primary driver, right? So um, I would wager, you know, that within a shortish period of time, within a couple of years, um, there'll be something like a sustainable sustainability rating uh, for for um, businesses, you know, even SMEs that, that will be important, that it'll have the same sort of value um, as a say credit rating right or even more of a value so so I think um, the sustainability is, is it's not just a sort of fad it's not CSR it's um core right and and the pandemic has brought that even um, more to the fore so um, I think I mean it's onto something and um, um, I think uh, it, it has to be in all discussions around um, food and, and everything else frankly can I just I was just going to sort of jump from from what Paul was saying um, around it's a pretty hard ask on the farm so on the farm that conversation around needing all of that data and um, you know having that data available for consumers it comes all the way back to actually on farm and those farmers having the ability to deliver on that I mean in, in countries there's a lag in connectivity um, farmers don't have the skills and actually the technology really isn't there on farm so I wonder Claudia if you've got some sort of um, Microsoft, I know, is working really hard in this space. You've got a number of um, solutions. You've mentioned farm beats. I mean, the solution really, to, in order to be able to deliver against any any call mark or any um, any information to consumers, you need the data and you need aggregated data and you need the tools and technologies on the farm to deliver on that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And that's really why we wanted to focus on farm level data in the first place, because it feeds through everything in the supply chain, no matter if you want to address uh, food safety issues, uh, supply chain challenges, uh, even things like automation. So it's a high priority. Like I said, I think for us, it's a combination of enabling technology on farms. We also understand that not every farmer is going to have like high tech on their farm or sensors or, or really rich information. But that's why it's so important to create the system of data where you have some really valuable uh, feed, uh, foot, sorry, field level data coming from sensors, coming from probes, and then you're able to mash that up with more readily available uh, data such as satellite information. And by creating those systems, we, we can draw insights over whole regions. And I think that's a very important concept because I personally don't think we'll see a place where, like I said, everyone is highly technologized on a farm. I don't see one system like just a QR code or just a sensor being the answer. I think it's a combination of those technologies. And just to give you an example on the food safety side, I completely agree with Paul. The current system is just completely not functional. But it's it's this is also about being able to predict where is a higher risk, where do we need to run audits, where do we need to uh, have field level probes by using AI, by using machine learning to detect where the highest risk is. So it's a combination of those technologies. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and that's a good point. Um, you know, it goes to the timeliness and the, the precision of what you're talking about. At the moment, most of, most of the supply chains around the world, you're auditing for these 
really important credence issues, uh, uh, they, they happen every three years or, or maybe every 18 months because of the cost and the time and it's manual process. And we, we need to get beyond that. Otherwise, as Paul says, that leads to many gaps for the bad players or not just the bad players, the players with, without data or sufficient controls. Um, and so then we move to sensors and devices and measuring and, uh, and you can't, farmers are not going to be able to instrument every paddock or every field with all the sensors that they'd love to. Um, and so we do need to find ways of using remote sensing and combination technologies like AI to fill in the gaps. Hang on. That's a really nice segue actually into the, into the investment that needs to be made on farm and actually in, in terms of other stakeholders involved in that conversation along the supply chain. Um, emerging technology innovation has obviously the potential to be, to be great um, in terms of its application, but also um, following the hype and, and trends um, can lead to actually suboptimal decisions. Um, so we've heard about machine learning um, and the fact that we're actually really only, we're really sort of far off um, real, true, natural AI. And we've, and we've also heard about blockchain and the cloud. Um, how can those working in and looking to invest in this space in terms of leveraging technology for agriculture, for the agricultural industry, mitigate hype and manage expectations to avoid making the wrong strategic decisions? I wonder if Amit, you could start us off with that, please. Um, sure, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, where do I begin? I mean, there are so many possibilities in terms of what we can do. Um, but obviously, it's about picking the right technologies at the right time and, and you know, um, putting it in context of your business. If we, you know, if you just consider what we've discussed over the last one hour, right? When you look at technology, if you're looking, for, let's just use the industry term farm to fork, right? And you look across the value chain, you're talking about, you know, devices, IoT sensors, analytics, data, um, machine learning, so many different things. It's not, you know, it's not one simple solution. Um, so it is a very, very complex ask. I think it's very confusing for companies when they're trying to make these decisions and, um, you know, especially for, um, you know, for farms who are really focused on um, their core business. But I think it also depends on, you know, what technologies you're considering to implement and what stage they're at in their journey, right? If they're early stage, it's really key to be part of, um, you know, some um, parts of some ecosystem or some research organizations, universities have uh, incubator programs. You can be part of, you know, proof of concepts, POCs, learn from, learn from that ecosystem. Um, that's a good way to start. If it's really early stage, if it's a more commercialized mainstream technology, that's where it becomes much more challenging because it's not just about the investment you're gonna make in the technology, it's about changing the way you operate your processes internally and externally with, your, uh, with the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, again, so I mean, there's a few things to consider. I think it has to be an outside-in view first. You have to look at the external factors, right? And the external factors, um, you know, really involve first of all learning from others' experiences, leveraging peer group research to see how other companies, similar organizations, how have they deployed these solutions? How have they benefited? Did they actually benefit? What were the pain points that they solved with these technologies? Are those aligned with the pain points you're hoping to solve? Or are there other better alternative technologies or, or solutions to look at? Who are the right vendors to work with? Because again, the complexity of dealing with uh, a solution that involves an IoT platform, sensors, you know, a data platform, and so on. It's just so many choices to be made. Who are the right partners to work with? How much should you be budgeting? Are you actually budgeting just for the implementation, or are you actually factoring in that there is going to be a lot of cost that may not be part of your initial implementation cost, but part of operational cost? So I think um, you've got to consider that. Um, and then eventually, I think you have to look internally to evaluate whether um, does the technology actually align with your business goals, or are you getting caught up in the hype because everyone else is doing it? In this digital world and social media world, we see so much all the time. Um, I learned a new term uh, actually last year, and I was probably a bit late in the game learning that term. It's called FOMO, it's the fear of missing out. And, and that's not a reason to invest in technology. It's got to be focused on your business goals. Second, do you have the skills or can you skill people in your organization to actually drive that? And there's a whole different conversation. I'd love to have at a separate time if we had time 
on how, and, and Paul had that in his slides, you know, how you can use technology to actually create alternative skill sets, especially for farms, because technologies like digital twin and virtual reality uh, can actually help you with that. But do you have skills to implement those technologies? And then finally, most important, is it going to integrate and is it interoperable? Is it going to work with your entire digital value chain? Because it's got to work with your suppliers, your customers, and your partners. So I think it's, there's, there's a whole bunch of things to consider, but um, I've tried to summarize it. I, I, it's, um, I, I think it's got to be an outside in view. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I'd, 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 oh, go ahead. No, I'd, I'd love to comment because I think what we're seeing in agriculture is actually a digital transformation we've seen in other industries as well. It's, it's almost like an evolution. A lot of what's happening right now is the pure instrumentation or the pure data collection that really needs to happen before we can really, and, and I think Paul said this in the beginning, uh, have this enough data to run uh, analytics to see the patterns, to look into predictive analytics. Where, where it really should go is into creating those digital feedback loops. But because you talked earlier about consumer and the demand that consumer have, I think there there is a future where it's more about personalized diets. We even see this with uh, animal and animal feeding today more personalized nutrition but if you if you're not able to collect this feedback you'll never really get to a stage where you can do this thing so for me it's an evolution but what I also want to say I kind of disagree that we need to wait the next 10 years because I see there is organization that create a digital twin of a chicken of a chicken barn even of a chicken gut to see how the gut is processing food so all if if you frame sort of your challenge the challenge you want to address i think you can get to success really quickly but you always want to have in mind what's the what's the um, you know is it animal welfare is it is it about ethical growing food is it about sustainable um, uh, measurements and so you need to be aware of the goals you want to accomplish. And, and I think just to add to that, um, I think all of us have seen a number of revolutions in terms of what technology will do. I'm certainly old enough to remember the internet revolution. Um, and I think we've been through a lot of hype cycle um, now and we're starting to get to the, the real juice around what will work and we're starting to see a lot more standardization and cooperation I, i'm reminded of the old investment adage that if you don't understand it you shouldn't buy it and i think that's the truth um i find agri businesses understand their business pretty well um certainly a lot better than i would as a technology vendor so if we can't make that digestible as a technology, then we shouldn't be um, trying to, you know, insert that into, um, insert that extra complexity into a supply chain. We're meant to be solving problems, not creating new ones. And I think um, when you see these hype cycles, often during the hype, it creates a whole lot of process problems and wasted money um, before you start to see the what's going to work in reality. I think the thing we've all missed, um, and this might be because we're all technologists, is um, actually there's the big education part on farm. We talked about on farm before, and um, while technology can help with education, I think creating simpler, easier solutions and educating farmers all over the world. It's easier to talk in the New Zealand context of because farmers do care about their land. There's a sense of kaitiaki, that guardianship that comes with being a New Zealander. And so we're very proud of that. And it's, in fact, it's in the um, ITP, I think, Peter. And um, we forget that there's huge, vast tracts of arable land and, and uh, in the you know, African continent and, and actually throughout Asia where um, there isn't much penetration of technology yet. And so we've got to start, we've got to be um, educating other food systems why why they need to have this data making it really simple to use in in using predictive analytics off drones off satellites as you see claudia start predicting where the problems are because since you can't get a broad brush approach you've got to start focusing on um, the squeakiest wheel in terms of where those production problems are and start working on those ultimately for the greater good 
So I think we, we all need to remember education is a big part of tech and digitization. Just picking up on Claudia's point and then connecting it with yours, Paul, is um is you know, if we were if we were a business and we were looking at some new emerging tech, um, you build an IT team. You know, if you don't want to outsource it, you build an IT team, you get a couple of, you know, a farmer doesn't do that. Like so the farmer has to leverage partnerships and um, you know, and and I guess um in New Zealand it's quite popular to sort of have um I guess cooperatives, you know, cooperations. Um, cooperation rather between different entities but I wonder what the model is what the what is the model for the agricultural industry I mean do you outsource to a big player do you partner do you you know do you build an IT team within the farm I mean it's a it's a it's a it's the same it's having the same impact the technology is but the model in order to be able to um, to adopt technology and on a continuous you don't want to go out and actually invest and then come back a few years later and realize you need to upgrade so how do you keep that continuum of continuous um, improvement with technology happening on farm Andrew any thoughts (laughs) he's writing it (laughs) yeah I I got my sharpie and my post-it notes and I was writing down some some thoughts Um, how do you do it uh, well, so so here, here's here's one point is um, our when we talk about hiring an IT team or we or any or any equivalent team, any of the the people who help with change management and adoption and and new technology, uh, a lot it comes back to business scale, right? So if you you're a cooperative turning over a uh, billion dollars a year, then you're going to have one sort of set of uh, expenditure that you can make on that sort of thing, and it, you'll do an investment based on value. If your farm turning over a um, uh, million dollars a year, then uh, and and most of that's turnover, and your profit margin is fairly small, your your ability to invest in those values is going to be much more limited. If you're a farmer in Africa and you're in tens of dollars a year, your ability to invest is also going to be and we have to take those things into account. Um, what I was jotting down was, and it really comes off the education and accessibility side, because I think simplicity of technology and ease of use of technology and accessibility, all, they're different, but they all go together, right? Um, uh, I had two examples just this morning. I had a call with um, uh, some people who were looking at data for sheep farming in uh, Armenia. Uh, which is a, an interesting place to be looking at that. Uh, and, and, you know, again, the, the ability to invest uh, versus the outcomes that you can get if you get the, the improvement from having some of the data. Uh, but simplicity is key. There's language barriers. Um, uh, if you can give them the data, can they do anything with it or are they going to be constrained by, uh, their, their lev- again, their level of finance and, and investment? Um, The other one was much more New Zealand farmer focused where there's a whole heap of data around managing drench resistance and animal welfare and all of that stuff. And there's quite a fine balancing line and there's some quite complex farm practices you can do to do that. And you can do testing and you can probably use sensors and all of that sort of stuff. But that's highly complex. And so most farmers just have a few rules of thumb and they say, I'm going to drench the sheep here. The ewes are going to follow the the, the lambs or whatever else it is. And there's a rule of thumb and it's, it's probably suboptimal, but on the other hand, maybe there is an economic balance that they've already achieved by kind of saying, well, I'm just going to use a rule of thumb rather than spend all of that time and the investment in the, in the technology. Great. That mention of, um, of education and also um, skills and also um, what's happening on farm is a nice sort of segue into the, I guess, the sort of summary is that, you know, we've talked about how digital technologies are changing agriculture and the food system from on-farm production, including supporting compliance to helping governments, improving the efficiency and effectiveness of policies and programs, um, and right across the value chain to the end consumer. But how can we ensure everyone benefits considering potential issues related to data protection, cybersecurity, uh, labor replacement and skills shortages, and the risk of actually further deepening the digital divide um, and its impact on communities and economies? Um, If we want to sort of, one of of you, I won't pick anybody in particular, want to kick off that conversation. I might try. Oh, sorry. No, much better you do it, Claudia. <laughs> I, I just went for it, but uh, I, I wanted to connect it with what we just talked about, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think 
Um, and I, I, I say that, and it might be provocative for that, but we want to have questions, so that's good. One pharma alone is not going to take a lot of advantage of technology. I mean, if it's a large pharma operation, of course, but really you want to be able to compare. So you need to look for those aggregators. And those aggregators can be organizations that are input providers, those can be equipment providers, those could be insurances banks. We really see uh, consumer good companies, retailers, we see all of them coming to this market and creating digital solutions. And I think it's a good thing because today a lot of the risk of farming really lays with the farmer and we wanna take this off pharma shoulders. Now, I completely understand there is fear and uh, assumed risk with sharing data. And I also think we as an industry need to work on that and really work on concepts where we sort of secure the rights and secure the data of, of a farmer. But I, there is absolutely no doubt that we need those concepts of aggregation and running more broader digital ag um, systems. Uh, that's just my perspective on it. I think um, at a market level, if consumers aren't satisfied with the products they're receiving, seeing how they grow and or feeling that by buying a product, they're contributing in some way to society or the planet or their own community uh, and moving away from those sort of concept of empty calories to something more meaningful to me as an individual. And, and I can't remember who mentioned personalized nutrition before. It's, a big chunk. So I think individual farmers do benefit when uh, data can flow through to the consumer that gives the consumer some confidence that the right thing is being done. Uh, again, I don't think consumers want soil health and water data. They want to know a farmer, for example, a dairy farmer is doing the right thing around water. And that's the farmer's benefit because ultimately a retailer or a marketplace or a brand selling direct to market, the way we've seen you know, Nestle and Danone and those big European corporates now going direct to consumer as well as supplying via platforms, marketplaces, retailers are starting to say, well, hang on, if you can't assure me of this, there's no way I'm risking my brand. And that's where uh, even small holding uh, farmers, small farmers uh, do have some advantages in terms of their ability to, add value to their product and, and have uh, be assured there's a customer or a consumer at the end of it. No consumer, no business, no farmer. Uh, if the farmer can't sell their product, it's over. And if you think back to the 1800s, everyone sort of bought flour from the local um, flour mill and they knew who that was and they probably knew the owner and they probably went, you know, uh, and, um, you know, socialized with the owner of the flour mill and they had lots of trust. And, and what we've done over the preceding um, century or two is take away all of those systems in a search for efficiency. And what we now need to do is return to say, well, I still want to know how you do things. I used, you know, my ancestors used to be able to see that. Now I, I want to know in a digital way. So there is a benefit to every grower, every farmer, every supply chain participant. And then if I feel pretty good that you're handling the risk of uh, food loss in your own production system and food waste at the consumer end, I'm pretty confident that that 25% of food that's wasted that Bradley mentioned um, is going to start going to people who need it. And I'm going to resolve the calorie deficit. At the same time, I'm going to make myself healthier. I, I think there's so much benefit and this rapidly changing expectation of consumers will frighten us. Because, you know, my mother knows how to use an iPhone um, pretty much as well as I do. She's 87 years old. And um, what Apple did was make it simple and digestible for her. And she could learn at her own, um, her own pace. And she's got better and better. She even sends emojis. It's frightening. Um, so we need to do that for the food system. And that goes to that question. The, the benefit to the farmer is make it simple, get them the data, let the consumer say, heck yes, I want to support Bob. Or Mary. Oh, totally, yeah. right. This is giving a totally unrelated idea, but really we should have emojis for seniors, like seriously. Like that yellow, like yellow face, not, you know. You would probably anyway. say no, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anything I, I, else? Anyone else? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, look, I think everything that Paul mentioned, I think, is is um, is absolutely spot on. But I think all the problems we're talking about are really developed world problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
frankly, in emerging countries, the developing countries, consumers don't want a choice. They just want food. They want food on their plate. They don't want a choice. Yeah. So they don't really care about how sustainable it was. They just want the food to get there. The problem we have is the farms are also very different because the farms aren't going to implement technology. They don't have any capability to implement technologies, right? That's where it needs a very different level of push. And I guess, you know, that's an area I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Bradley and his team are probably a lot more involved in because that's where, you know, the majority of the population is in the world. And the challenge in some of those countries is the farmers can't get their produce to the customer. It just rots. 90% of the produce will rot before it gets reaches the customer. So, you know, it's a completely different view of food waste. So I think um, there's got to be some thinking around, uh, and I know it might not be relevant to a New Zealand context, but I think, um, you know, from a global context, I think there's got to be some thinking around how do you enable those solutions? Because those solutions require a lot more than selling into a farmer a technology solution. It requires putting a weight behind it. And that's where, you know, various agencies and, and technology providers and, uh, and governments need to look at some form of partnerships. And there is just such a strong need to focus on that, especially given the pandemic, because it's only going to get harder for those countries with unemployment, lockdowns. So also something just to consider. Well, Bradley's going to pop on now and he's going to have something to say. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thanks, uh, Janat and, and Amit. Yeah, so uh, Amit's right. I mean, uh, but that's precisely when, so when I mentioned that um, through this Global Innovation Institute that we're going out looking for um, digital farming technologies from the developing world that can be, you know, from the Global South, whatever phrase you want to use, um, but for the Global South, right? So we're looking at solutions that aren't super, I mean, sure, they, they, they are using technology in really creative ways, um, but they're not so sophisticated, infrastructure heavy, and so expensive that, that they can't be used in the developing world context. So we're, we're hopeful that, that these do translate well. Um, is it gonna solve everything? Absolutely not. As you said, um, in, in the developing world, um, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia even, um, um, much more vulnerable to, to um, even the most minor shocks. And so, um, you know, when the pandemic happens, like we're suffering now, I mean, if, if markets in, in, in say the U S or, or Australia, um, start to shutter or start to slow down, um, the, the ripple effects across the world in some of these places in Africa and South Asia are, are horrendous. And, and what, whatever digital technology you have in the world, isn't going to, going to, uh, make a huge difference. Um, but, but, but what's interesting too is, is how, you know, it, this, so there's digital agriculture and technology, but it, it's linking also to um, financial access as well, right? It's, it's, it's the sort of FinTech and Agritech nexus in a way um, where if, you know, it, it's also about getting farmers a lot more data, not just about their, their crops um, and, and the water uh, supply and, and the weather, but also about their finances, right? And, and market conditions and, and connecting them to markets much better. So, so there's that whole part too around, um, you know, not just financial inclusion, which I think is kind of an awful phrase now, um, but, but about how, you know, what's the better way? Is it financial prosperity? Is it how, how, do, how do we use technology to help folks thrive, right? Uh, especially in the developing world. So, so there are some really interesting opportunities there that, that kind of combine um, the, the, you know, increasing yields through, say, Internet of Things and so forth, but also um, digital finance that brings um, more financial security, um, not just food assurance, but financial assurance to, to, to farmers who need it the most in the developing world. So there, there are different angles for sure. Um, you know, you're not going to have you know, a farmer in Kenya or in Laos, um, with a whole fleet of drones uh, flying around, but but you've got cool things like um, you know, Hello Tractor. If, if you've not heard of Hello Tractor, but it's um, it's it's like the Uber for tractors that started out uh, from Nigeria um, and and sort of exploding in a sense through many um, countries in, in Africa. So um, all sorts of great ideas and, and, and innovations that are happening. I just add one point on that. I, there's some great examples of what you just mentioned, Bradley, because you're absolutely right. I mean, this is where, um, you know, microfinance comes in. 
And there's a couple of great examples. Um, and I'll take a farming one, agriculture one, and a non-agriculture one. Um, you know, from an, from an agriculture perspective in, in Cambodia, but um, I'll give you a really interesting mature example out of Bangladesh because a very significant percentage of the population in Bangladesh is employed in the garment manufacturing sector, right? And consumers, so to the point that we were making earlier, consumers want a choice. And so the microfinance, uh, microfinance is big, uh, has picked up really well in, in, in Bangladesh. And there's a couple of examples where they're trying to actually work with the small garment manufacturers that they're uh, financing, enabling them with technology capabilities so that they can then offer a transparent view of the supply chain to customers at the end customer. So whether it be a Gap or Zara or whoever. And what it does is it gets the fun financing into the manufacturer, but then the manufacturer is actually able to demonstrate that because um, garment manufacturing is just very, very polluting to the environment, extremely polluting to the environment. Um, so it takes care of addressing the, you know, how uh, environmentally friendly their process was, manufacturing process was, but then also in, you know, ensures visibility and transparency into wage, you know, fair wages and, and making sure there was there wasn't exploitation of labor and so on. So consumers could have a choice. So to what Bradley was saying, there's some very simple solutions just require a little bit of effort in terms of thinking of the higher impact that we can create. And, and I think, um, New Zealand, for example, has a huge opportunity to go and enable some of these emerging countries. Uh, you know, as a Kiwi living in Singapore, I, I take a lot of pride in that. I mean, you know, we, we rank uh, top of the charts for lots and lots of things, whether it's ease of doing business and, 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 and so on. And I think agri-tech, obviously, you know, we are a very advanced, um, agrarian economy. So I think there's also an opportunity for New Zealand to take some of these uh, practices and maybe apply those uh, to some of these other problem areas. And, and just to follow up on that, um, once again, I mean, we, did, we haven't talked about this, another aspect of, of, of all this data, right? Um, you know, collecting data, integrating data um, um, from farmers and from agriculture. Uh, so a huge expense for farmers, no matter where they are in the world, is, is around insurance, right? So presumably, um, you know, we can start using this perfusions, proliferation of data on, on crop yields and water and everything else. Um, to, to really refine um, and make more efficient the insurance markets, right? The, so turning it from food data into financial data, right? Um, that, that can really help farmers no matter where they are in the world, right? So um, I think this could have a hugely transformative effect. And I think really soon, um, I think it's to some extent already happening. So there's a sort of, there's the data for farming, but that revolution, but there's a data for um, uh, farm insurance uh, revolution that's, that's about to come. I just want to go back to the point uh, Amit made earlier, and that is, I, I think um, while a consumer perhaps in Kenya or um, other parts of Africa may not care so much about sustainability development goals as to getting enough food, but I do think consumers do care about safety and whether or not the food is safe. And I think farmers care about yields. So if they're buying fertilizers that aren't what they say they are, that can be three months worth of income uh, lost in terms of not only yield but the cost of the fertilizer. So there are some real, there are some data points that farmers in those areas do care about. That doesn't mean we're going to go and rush um, a whole lot of internet connected 5G um, driven applications into market with mixed reality. What it does mean is we need to reflect the technology state of the environment we're going into and simplify the solutions while adding um, that level of that level of um, of education that goes with it, but I think we've got to be careful in the tech world. We don't just say I'm going to overcomplicate this process massively. There's going to be data everywhere, and there's going to be huge databases, and I'm going to write TensorFlow models, and I'm going to you know machine learn the heck out of this and change your farm. I think uh, consumers are saying, well, I want to make sure it's safe and not. Um, unsafe and I want to and if I'm a farmer I really want to make sure what I'm putting onto my fields to improve yield is actually what it says it is might be a great place to start yeah can I, do I have I have I exceeded my my airtime quota can I, do I, do I get another minute I, I, I completely agree with, with, with what Paul is saying um, and you know 
all, all I'm saying is the problems are different and there's a different approach we need to take to solve those problems. So if we take the example um, of the Sub-Saharan African countries or South Asia, for example, or even parts of Southeast Asia, it's, you know, governments have to have a role to play. And, and you know, if you, if you think about, you know, we know there's 5G services that are gonna be rolled out and everyone talks about those things. How do you make them more meaningful? First of all, governments, in these countries are going to be very, very short for cash to you know, invest in technology. So it does require different kinds of public-private partnership models that would, that would need to exist. Second, there needs to be a whole of sort of, I can't think of the term, but whole of agriculture sort of solution for those countries, right? Brought by those public-private partnerships. And you know, if you look at technologies um, such as digital twin and you know you touched on virtual reality I, what the hell I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and give that example the beauty of it is with um, with these digital twins of farms of equipment of machines of um, various various assets um, you can actually enable someone on the ground who's not really trained or qualified as, as an engineer or but with the help of someone sitting in a control room who is qualified, uh, with a who has a digital twin of that particular farm, can actually enable the farmer to implement some of those things, right? These, these are, there are applications of technology, um, but I think those are some probably more aspirational at the moment, but I think what it does, all I was trying to say was, I think it does require a larger perspective of how do you create a greater impact? And I think one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is uh, a sense of empathy, and I think, this is an opportunity to, to perhaps uh, focus on that. And I think that's where my point was, I think New Zealand has a huge opportunity to take some of these technologies and focus on some public private partnership models, whether it's working with you know, agents, global uh, agencies such as Bradley's, UN, whether it's UNDP or whether it's the World Bank or there are various other organizations. But I think it requires a very holistic approach um, because those farmers aren't gonna be able to implement or even view some of those on their iPhones because they don't have iPhones. Thank you, Amit. So um, that ends the panel session, but what we've got is some Q&A um, coming through. And so I've had a chance to go through some of the um, questions and I've got one for, the, for, for all the speakers now. Um, even if you have great systems, so even if we get the data right and we get that messaging to the consumer right, um, how do you tackle social influences that set out to destroy branding? So how do you how do you how do you compete with what's happening on social media when it comes to messaging to consumers around what's safe, what to buy? Um, any comments around that? Everyone's smiling. <laughs> uh, I might start. Um, so we we look after about eighty percent of the infant milk formula brands out of region. We look after a lot of honey, a lot of wine, a lot of meat, um, nutraceuticals. Etc. in terms of consumer engagement. So it's the brands that don't engage directly with their consumers that have to worry about destructive, um, opinionated social media hacks. And it's the brands engaging directly with their customers with a data back story. And I think that's the key thing. If, if they show their customers, I've, I've got the data, um, I can back up my story and I care enough about you to tell you the story. They're not seeing the, the damage created by um, fake review or by um, maliciously minded KOLs in some markets. Um, and they're also better able to navigate uh, geopolitical changes that we're currently seeing given the tensions in the world. Um, they're able to actually engage again directly with consumers and avoid suffering the sometimes nationalist pride in some countries. So I think yeah, one-to-one -one consumer engagement is is um, what everyone's genuinely seeking. There's a risk management aspect too, isn't there, Paul? Um, because if you are positioning your product with a certain set of credence attributes or a certain set of things that you are saying about your, your product, it's natural, it's unpolluted, um, uh, then even before you get any pushback on that, you need to be saying, well, what could go wrong? What am I going to gather the data on and put in place so that I, I can stand behind that claim? Yeah, glycophosphate in honey is a good example, right? So yeah. um, we, we do look after a lot of honey and all those brands are testing for glycophosphate and are able to be absolutely sure of the quality of their raw material That's right. before they ship. 
So I think that's a really good example. It is, it's risk management as well. Yeah. All right, another question here um, relates more to um, the Manuka honey industry, which is quite big in, in New Zealand. Um, and and most, I know people in Singapore and around the world enjoy enjoy manuka honey from New Zealand. So, what advice would you give the manuka honey industry, given the recent noise here around traces of um, glyphosate, especially around how we better manage and reduce the use of glyphosate, or is it something that we simply nothing can be done about and we just wait for the media storm to pass? I think I just um, unfortunately front footed that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I, I don't think you can wait for media storms to pass. Um, I, I think there's two issues around Manuka in New Zealand, and one is this glycophosphate story. And uh, there, but there are a lot of brands um, carefully avoiding glycophosphate traces by testing for it. And um, if they have a batch of honey that is. Um, has a glycophosphate traces they you know they don't go and package it and sell it as premium honey so i, I think good honey companies are already protecting new zealand reputation so there's a bit of scaremongering in that um, our second problem is our australian cousins have decided tea tree is actually manuka and so we're causing huge brand confusion as well so um i, I think you have to again have uh a, a brand story direct to consumer to say I'm testing, I'm being careful, I'm controlling my supply chain, I'm controlling my raw material. And honey raw material in New Zealand is actually very well controlled. The MPI's done a great job of, of managing EDs through the process. So you can actually track a um, generally hive to pot anyway. Um, so test, test and test again uh, is the story of COVID world, but it's also the story of honey. Anyone else on that um, topic around honey and glyphosate? No. Yeah, we love we love manuka honey. <laughs> it's not pure. The good stuff. Machine, machine learning is used in that actually. Hill Laboratories here, isn't it, Andrew? In the Waikato, do the yeah, do the machine learning algorithms in that space, um, which well, is interesting. Well, I'm big in that. Yeah. Yeah. Also from the Waikato, I believe. Just want to say. <laughs> Yeah, the mighty Waikato. <laughs> the mighty Waikato, that's right. Fastest growing tech region in the country, two years in a row. Um, so uh, another question, sorry? I still support the Highlanders, I'm sorry. I support Australia, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, another question, so thinking about the supply chain and we've talked about the social media impact in terms of messaging to consumers and obviously we're here for consumers and if we think um, of, of those that do use social media, so not the digital divide in this conversation. Um, but what about other tools that, that, that consumers have access to? I know over COVID, um, Uber Eats was really big over here in New Zealand, um, probably in Singapore as well. That added cost and expense onto food. I mean, how does that then filter down that the farmers aren't getting any more? Um, I, guess, I guess the product is selling, but what is the incentive for farmers to use technology? And then how do you counter that, that investment? and not reduce, not increasing the price of goods, but actually that added in, added cost then um, at the other end of the value chain when it comes to the consumer. It's a real challenge, isn't it? And I was thinking about it uh, earlier when we were talking about some of our other things that, you know, when you're looking at adopting technology full stop, you have to make sure you're not cargo culting. That's that fear of missing out thing again. Um, uh, you're, that you're actually, um, you're looking at the value proposition for you. So if you're a farmer looking at technology, then look, it needs to do one of things, one of three things. It needs to enable you to sell or keep selling into the markets that you're wanting to target, or it needs to improve the price of what you're getting paid, or it needs to cut some costs out of your business. There has to be an efficiency or, or other sort of benefit. Uh, if you're doing it and it's just adding costs to your business and you could choose not to do it because the market doesn't require it, then you shouldn't be doing it. But but so then then there's an, a matching question and I've had this conversation with um, with companies, particularly supermarkets in the sort of the more UK European context where if you're going to demand those standards, are you going to pay any more? No, we're not. So... So where is, you know, where's the supply chain value? And I might leave you if you don't um, look after my interests. It might be the bigger problem. Yeah. 
and you're seeing lots of disruptive brands into markets and take on big traditional um, brands and win in many, many sectors. Um, and, you know, I look at plant-based um, protein and Impossible Burger and businesses like that. And their big advantage uh, is actually supply chain because they don't have to grow an animal to produce mm. protein. They can store raw material for as long as they need to and respond to demand much faster. So supply chain is their big advantage. So I, look, I think the reality is if you can't serve your customers' requirements, the rest is pretty irrelevant. So if you don't like Uber Eats, you need to find another local mechanism to deliver it. And, and I know there's a lot of noise in New Zealand about Uber Eats and how much they took from the restaurants, but I don't see the local alternative succeeding either. Um, you know, there's a lot of noise about it, but I, I still see Uber Eats numbers are pretty strong in New Zealand. Yeah. Absolutely. I think even I use it twice before I realize actually they add extra cost to the cost of the food. <laughs> I didn't and, know that. and take some of the, the margin on the food. Yeah, yeah and I didn't know that. But, but at one point, you couldn't go to the take. You know, you were in, a, in New Zealand, we were on complete lockdown. So you couldn't even go and pick food up. Um, hey, um, Hi, another... Janet. Hi, Jan Janet. So can I just add one extra thing on yes, supply yes. chain? This is Peter. Um, I think, um, again, really reflecting on the environment with which we're currently living in, this kind of, you know, uh, moving on the post-COVID um, environment. Um, I think supply chains are going to become much more local and regional. Um, I think there are going to be a number of challenges for global supply chains. And uh, just as an example, this morning I was speaking to you know, a very good contact I have in uh, North America. Um, and they were talking about you know, buying local. So I mean, obviously the North America is a very big area, but um, I think this concept of buy local is becoming um, more, um, more, more apparent. Um, and so although we kind of bag our you know, Australian colleagues occasionally, um, uh, I, I wear two hats as well as looking after Agritech New Zealand. I'm also on the Australian New Zealand um, Agritech Council. Um, and just one great example of a recent um, joint initiative. We're both looking at um, seeing how we can uh, develop research to address some of our water challenges. Um, and so there's a Trans-Hasman Water Challenge. Uh, really looking at the issue of availability, management, quality. Um, and I suspect there are going to be much more regional initiatives like this built up, not just in this region, but other parts of the world um, as we exit the post-COVID world, because people will be looking at that kind of more local regional environment um, in which to operate. So I think that's just something we need to be cognizant of, that when borders are lifted, what happens before COVID is not necessarily going to be the same the offshore landscape is going to be potentially quite different. And that's something certainly I, wearing my New Zealand hat, advise New Zealand agritech companies that when we are able to travel again, don't necessarily expect your markets to be thinking in the same way as they were maybe in <clears throat> you know, January, February this year. That's good advice, Peter. That's a really good point also when it comes to where we started off from, which is global partnerships and collaboration. I was talking at the Agritech ITPN's, uh, ITP launch the other day about how um, you need partners on the ground in other countries in order to support your exports. Um, and I guess it's the same in terms of, of um, partners on the ground that can then add to add value to your product in terms of that, that sharing of data and the messaging to consumers. Any comments around that? Uh, no, the, the, the only to, only just to uh, confirm what you've said there, Janet. Uh, absolutely yeah, critical absolutely. for. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, um, I have to, absolutely critical, and I know you know as an organisation, uh, and working with ITP, one of the um, work streams within within ITP is called the global uh, work stream, and the whole concept is how do we improve our global footprint? So how do we ensure that New Zealand's agritech sector does have those connections in other markets um, to be able to scale? Because you know, we are not necessarily in the edge of the world, but we're certainly quite a long way distant from some of those markets. And so having that internal um, support um, kind of networks is really important going forward. Yeah. I think uh, we're I, in the part of the world, isn't it? Because isn't the sun rise here? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just, just wanted to add, I think, um, I think New Zealand's um, capability around agriculture and farming and innovation in agriculture and farming is quite well known. Uh, I think that's what we're well known for. So I think from an agri-tech standpoint, there is a, there is a whole lot of 
uh, positive branding that's already out there for New Zealand. Uh, and I think that there is a strong opportunity to actually make a difference. Uh, we've been at the cutting edge of innovation right right from the start. I mean, go back 100 years and, you know, everything from refrigerated shipping to, you know, a uh, whole bunch of other farm technologies uh, in earlier days as well. So uh, I think it's just about uh, leading with some of those um, innovation stories. Yeah, yeah and look, I think um, we have this unique advantage in New Zealand because we are a small economy. Um, and it's quite easy to get to senior um, executives in um, both large farming organizations and of course to farmers individually, but also we have a, a number of different food systems. So we, we're leading the way in regenerative, for example, um, or some people are leading the way in regenerative, I should say. And we have a great tech sector because we can go test on global brands in New Zealand, perfect and then ship that offshore. Our farming systems aren't always the same as farming systems in other countries. So for example, the way you uh, produce milk in New Zealand is very different than the way you produce it in the US, for example. And, um, but the capability, the tech savvy, and the ability to treat ourselves as a test bed. And I think it's quite telling that co uh, companies like Microsoft are building data centers here now. Um, in this tiny little country at the bottom of the world, Microsoft seen that there's going to be a lot of data flowing out of here that's useful and as part of that um, I don't want to call ourselves an incubator for uh, tech for global tech but we're kind of like a, um, a microcosm of Silicon Valley in New Zealand where you can pick up the phone get a decision maker have a conversation and get lots of really good feedback um, in a way you just can't um, in large corporatized farming systems, for example, or where there's lots of small um, landholders. Yeah, the one thing I want to add, and Peter knows I'm a New Zealand fan, and everything I learned about New Zealand agriculture through um, you know him and um, the visit there is is just amazing. So I think a lot of the innovation I saw in New Zealand is driven by the macro needs that you have in New Zealand, and you know we haven't talked about automation and labor issues at all today. I think that's one big area of innovation, but but many others around supply chain food quality, being able to measure sustainability footprint of a, of a brand. I think I saw a lot of amazing work there. What I find working with startups is it's, it's important to be very specialized, but it's also important to look over the pond what else is out there. In fact, I see a lot of reinventing the wheel around the world when it comes to digital innovation. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of looking for some modular standard component and then uh, drive incremental innovation on top of those components. And really, this is also a concept that we're driving in Microsoft, no matter if it's for IoT devices or uh, we talked a lot about digital twins or robotics or uh, analytic models. It's like take a, a standard module, but then drive innovation on top. Yeah, if I can also just add to that, Claudia, I don't know whether you heard, but Microsoft actually announced their first anchor tenant for their data center in <laughs> New Zealand this morning, uh, namely Fonterra. So in terms of agricultural data, there'll be no lack of data to, uh, to, to have access to. So um, that announcement was only made in the last 24 hours. Very exciting. Great, isn't it, for the country, yeah? Like it's, it's, it's the ag um, with the tech together. And look, I think um, I think we've got lots of examples where tech business has commoditized great tech. So, for example, if you think about wireless connectivity at home, uh, um, and certainly in New Zealand, and this is um, becoming the case globally, um, that was all driven by Intel adding a Citrino chip. You know, back in the early two thousands, sticking in a standardized Wi-Fi chip into um, you know, Microsoft Windows machines and they went everywhere and suddenly people said, oh, I quite like this wireless thing at home as well. And it uh, combined with ADSL and, and, and hybrid fiber coax in the US to create uh, what we now know and then created a whole business model around Netflix and compression and where we all came from was a tech company saying, we're gonna standardize this. You don't know what you need it for yet, but we're gonna standardize it. And so we're seeing that again now, lots of tech being standardized, democratized, made easy to get. Um, and you'll just see that flowing uh, across the world, including into, uh, you know, poorer nations that don't have the infrastructure today, 
you'll see low earth orbit at, at, um, satellites for um, internet access. You'll see a whole bunch of stuff occurring. And Rocket Lab, of course, putting up lots of low Earth orbit satellites out of New Zealand. It's nice to beat the Australians at the space race. Sorry, Peter. I know you've got an Australian hat on too. If, if I can pick up on one one final bit that um, Claudia said. You know, we often in New Zealand, perhaps because of our distance to markets, and maybe at the moment because of not being able to travel, there's a lot of reinvention going on. Um, and um, and so coming back to your original question, Janet, some of our partnering is not just about reaching markets. Some of our partnering needs to be about reuse of technologies and components and collaboration in those areas as well. Um, just what, we've got a couple. We've got probably about thirty seconds, I think, Chris, if if you're there. Um, but just sort of quickly, is is it? Are we scared of AI? Is it taking jobs? Are we worried at the agriculture industry? I just want to pick up on Claudia's point around we didn't really deep dive into automation, but it's not the case. Yes, no. No, no. I think, I think if I can just say, I think human-machine collaboration actually has a tremendous amount of potential to create more better employment opportunities. And my view is actually, you know, humans aren't going to have to learn tech. Tech will have to learn how to help people. And that's, that's what it's going to be. And we can elaborate on that separately. But I mean, the example of digital twins, for example, in virtual reality is one where you can create alternative employment opportunities without people actually having to be engineers. They can be skilled up. So I think qualifications will get trumped by skills. And I think uh, human machine collaboration, I think, has a lot of possibilities. So love to get Claudia's thoughts on that. I, I mean, I completely second this. It's really uh, technology enabling human, enabling human decision. I said this before, and I saw a comment about usability. Also, I think usability for me, to your point, completely comes from contextual advice, like how it's delivered. I mean, we can translate recommendations in different languages using cognitive services. We can call people. We can uh, send text messages. It doesn't have to be even an app, but the important point, it's contextual. It's what I need right now on a farm, no matter if I'm rural farming or, or a developed world to make a better decision now. I think that's really what, what's important. I think we'll wrap up now. Um, we'll, well, thank you very much to everybody who's joined the Q&A and to the speakers and the um, panelists. Um, there's a few, there's a bit more information about an upcoming event, um, a global launch event for, um, as part of the Singapore FinTech Festival. Please, um, please join that 3rd of August, 2020. Um, and that wraps up our session for today. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Joining Thank in. You. Thank Great. you. Thanks guys.